Unauthorized opinions expressed on the internet would be censored. We are live. We are live. This is real. <laughs> Welcome back to Unauthorized Opinions, uopod.com. Like, share, subscribe. It's pure propaganda and it's super cringe, by the way. I literally went to the polls with nothing in mind. I saw a can of orange soda in the parking lot. <laughs> and it's I was like, yeah, there we go. An unopened can of orange soda just chilling <laughs> in the parking lot. I was like, yeah, I got to vote for Trump, dude. Your podcast sucks it's mental mate it's absolutely mental i'll be honest i thought it was kind of offensive when you talk so much about the loch ness monster political climate and andrew treat yourself okay especially if you start i don't know getting getting in good with homeless people unauthorized opinions streaming everywhere at uopod.com doodly <laughs> Our hair is out of control. We're adjusting the mic, making sure the mic isn't killing anybody. Unauthorizedopinions.com, uopod.com. We've got so much to get to here today, and I'm wondering how I'm going to do it. How could I possibly do it? We watched UFC last night, and they did this whole UFC noches thing, and... I couldn't help but sit there and wonder, you know. I couldn't help but sit there and wonder why they felt this was necessary. Now, they spent untold millions on the production for this event. As you can see some of the photos here. It was for Mexican Independence Day. It was for, I don't know, the people of Las Vegas driving by as they... As they could see the outside of the the sphere and be careful not to call it the sphere it's just sphere allegedly but we did this and they spent untold millions to get this message across of you know the indigenous cultures of mexico the indigenous peoples their struggles that they had in mexico and the colonialism and the pillaging of our lands no mention of you know the aztecs there was mention of the aztecs but no mention of their human sacrifice obviously we're glossing over we're going to put the good things in there however i couldn't help but think about what's going on politically right now and why this is being done i don't know you know you've got the cartels mostly running the country you've got the fentanyl you've got the illegal immigration i just didn't think that it was a great time to be pushing forward with stuff that is super pro mexico because they said they're never going to do this again so they showed these images and I can't help but think, well, would they do this for America? The UFC probably would. Well, why didn't they? Would they do this for Canada? No. Why should they? They should have done it really for Brazil, probably, with how much influence that country has had on MMA and mix and jiu-jitsu and everything. You could have brought back your Amanda Nunes, former champion, Anderson Silva, Vanderlei Silva, people like that. So many Brazilians who have impacted the sport. But in a night that it was all about Mexico... When they're talking about, oh, the poor indigenous, the poor, poor indigenous people against the colonialists, it's hard to hear that stuff and not think, what are we doing here? Because I don't care which country it's about, I don't want to hear about how terrible people treated you. I understand if you want to do that in your own country, but this was in America, in Las Vegas, which wasn't exactly built by, like, interns or slavery, it was built in, like, Las Vegas was built in like the 60s by mobsters and companies. And the Sphere is a technological marvel that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, built in America. So it's kind of like, well, why aren't you using that to celebrate America instead of Mexican independence and all this other weird indigenous stuff they, they went through? And barely, I don't know if any Mexicans actually won, maybe won. There are some other, there are a lot of people who spoke Spanish that weren't Mexican. Chilean, Argentinian, Valentina Shevchenko won her belt back. She speaks Spanish. I think she danced in Argentina. But it was just that feeling, given what's going on, and given the border, and given the fentanyl, and given the cartels, that Mexico is not at its best right now, and that's not something that should be having millions of dollars burned, theoretically, uh, metaphorically to, to be in support of that's my feeling and i think the take that it was it, oh it's just so cool of course the graphics and the, and the presentation was cool but it's very bro 
like Gen X low IQ take to just be like you can't have a problem with anything just because it's big and fantastic. Like if it was just supporting the BLM riots, would people be like, "Oh, the graphic"? I've never heard so many people say how amazing it is. You, I don't think you'd be saying that. So it it was a little off putting to me, and and it went further than I think the normal the normal thing you would do to celebrate another culture in your country. It was very much so if if the United States was being represented and the story and the narrative being driven was like, oh, and the evil Europeans came and they gave the natives smallpox and stole their land. It was very much like that. So it was uh, pretty lame and cringe in that sense. But we did get some good fights from it. And I wanted to share um, this gigantic gash from Mexican fighter Irene Aldana, who had one of, I think, one of the top 10 female fights of all time. They took down whomever on Twitter, her getting this sewn up. Losing four straight fights here, and that is... A gigantic gash. Really, when they were sewing her up, it's like, you ever watch those surgery shows or anything like that where, you, where something's been numbed, and it looks like the human body's just a sack of meat? That's what it was like when they were sewing that up. That was from a head clash. And she also had a big cut across her nose... And then another cut here. So she was stitched up like Frankenstein. I'm hoping for the best for her because this was a truly disturbing <laughs> cut. And, you know, you know how much women care about their face and everything. But to go in there and just have your skull split open like that was truly disturbing. And I think that um, I think there deserves to be accolades. Hopefully there's going to be a specialist that comes in and and repairs that for her, but it was a great event. They didn't have, you know, the fanfare that you would think. They didn't have the celebrities that you might have thought. It wasn't just like, it was, it was a strange event. It was weird. The first half of it, they sort of didn't really utilize the graphics. They just made the giant back of the sphere look like a cage, and it was very underwhelming. Then they made it a graphic, and then eventually they did all these, uh, you know, really dominating performances using the whole screen. But I was wondering why they didn't just make the entire background the screen at any point, because it would have looked really cool and really crazy for what was happening in the octagon to be used as the backdrop. It would literally look larger than life. Instead, they had, like, designated spots, digital spots for TVs. You know what I'm saying? Because they can make the whole thing. But they had des they had these spots. They were the, the best spots ever. They had designated spots on the screen for, like, TVs. So they would show these weird angles where they'd be recording off screen the giant screen which with fake screens on it i don't know i didn't really like it our next story is about your guy the main guy the big guy <laughs> you might call him leah thomas i guess his name's william i don't i i kept calling him luke when i was writing this story and somebody had to correct me i don't know if i was thinking of luke and leah skywalker or luke is just more similar to leah but it's William Thomas, and William Thomas is back. He's back in full force, and not because of something he's done recently, but because of something that he did, and somebody's finally talking about it. This is a Hungarian girl who was also an NCAA swimmer, uh, 2016 Olympian named Reka Georgi, and she was basically talking about her experience at the NCAA championships. So long story short, we'll play her, her words here, she was talking to a couple teammates or other girls outside of the women's change room and she goes to go in and as she's going in, Leah, Big Daddy Toms is coming out and they sort of, you know, she's going in, he's coming out and she turns into him and she re quickly realizes her junk is pressed up against him, <laughs> you know, pressed up against her arm. He's 6'4", she's 5'9". And she's like kind of in shock. There's a guy coming out of the change room. What's going on here? And she said he sort of just smiled. I said, sorry. I don't know how he sounds, but she said it was in a man's voice. So this is uh, Rekka Georgi. Let's uh, hear what she had to say. It's a minute long. I remember the first time I ran into Thomas. It was one day before the meet started. I was talking with one of my teammates on the pool deck in front of the locker room door. I opened the locker room door and was about to turn around and walk into the locker room to change when I physically bumped into Thomas. I was shocked by his size. 
He was about six feet four inches tall. And I was shocked that as he bumped into me, his male genitalia was touching my hand that was stuck between us as he was leaving the locker room. I couldn't even say sorry. I froze and he just smiled at me and said sorry in a male voice. We did not even have a women's locker room for the NCAA Women's National Championships. I repeatedly looked over my shoulder the whole time while I was changing. I was terrified knowing he could walk in on me at any seconds as I changed into my swimsuit and the private areas of my body would be exposed to this man and my privacy and desire not to expose myself to a man unwillingly stripped from me. So that's the creepy recollection of of Leah Thomas being in the women's locker, the the change room at the NCAA Women's Championship, but that's how that goes. So, of course, allegedly not submissible in court, hearsay, Your Honor. We all know, I'm not a lawyer, by the way, we all know the reasons behind this. Now, the main argument is he feels like a woman. He, he, he feels like a woman. Um, but all men know what would drive a man to, to want to be a woman, to want to compete against women. And that's because he feels he was mistreated or that he never got attention from women. So on one hand, it's like, you know, these girls never paid attention to me and that's not fair. And I'm such, I'm a great person. And while that might be true, the solution there is now I'm the girl. Now I have the power. I'm the pretty girl. I can reject the men at the same time that, that, that revenge thing that's happening there is also, I'm going to, you know, beat the crap out of them in whatever sport. Sometimes it's boxing. Other times it's just swimming. So on one hand, you know, you want to be the pretty girl who's in control. Now I can reject the women. Also, I can beat these women and show them and they're not anything. They're, they're trash. I can beat them easily. So there's all these weird components that every man knows that that's what the type of guy that would do something like that. That's the type of guy who would who would have these feelings about wanting to become a woman, um, a lonely, weird guy. And then on top of that, you've got the whole mental illness capacity there that drives them to actually follow through on that. Of course, all here say, Your Honor, I'm not a lawyer. This is not admissible in court. It's just my opinion. We have to say these things. We have to say it. We have to be perfect, but the creepiness factor from the girl's perspective is a guy could walk in at any time when otherwise it wouldn't happen is that you might press up against his dong when he's there. And, you know, a guy doesn't want to be walked in on by women changing either because we are disgusting and we don't want uh, to, to be judged either. And in, unless we think it's hilarious, which many times it is, but it's the physical threat that the women have to worry about. You don't have to worry about a woman coming into a men's locker room and, you know, just, you know, there's no threat there. But the other way around there is. So, but this is a place without security and. Allow men and women's change rooms and in North America for some reason this is you know a hotly debated issue that is now pretty much over in terms of the hormones and stuff for children you know nobody really cares about whether or not a guy wants to pretend he's a woman and go into a drag queen bar or whatever but the pushing of it on children has been you know pretty much defeated in more liberal places in Europe in the UK and places that people in North America that are leftists would generally point towards are not in agreement with them on it. So they really just live in their own world in terms of this. It's a very unique American and Canadian problem where they think it's, you know, the best thing in the world for some reason. And that extends to adults in a lot of situations where it's just basically like, hey, deal with it. Uh, 50 other girls need to deal with this to make this one guy feel comfortable and that's just the epitome of you know postification of culture and and not wanting to be mean to somebody we shouldn't have to tiptoe around this guy's feelings for for women's feelings and for their safety because that's supposed to come first and that's the weird thing about it and because of this you know swimming has has banned it cycling women's cycling has banned it 
Um, it's going to be coming with Dart soon, I predict. There's a bunch of sports, of course. Not not boxing, that's for sure. A bunch of women's sports that are, you know, kicking the men out because, you know, like that's real sexism there where it's like, I don't care about your feelings. These are my feelings as a man and they trump your feelings. So I get to do whatever I want and say whatever I want and take your sport away uh, from you and defeat you at it, which is obviously going to be the outcome almost every time. So we move on to, um, I think, one of the worst video games all, of all time. One of the, at least the, the dumbest on the face of it video game of all time. And it's called um, Dustborn. And I'm going to bring it up for you first here. And it's doing, it's done terrible on Steam. And it is basically about a, I don't know if this is a trans woman or a non-binary woman. Traveling across what is called the Divided States of America. And you are with a ragtag group of, you know, fat non-binary chicks, obese people, pathetic white guys, and robots with pronouns. Depending we're on a weekend... I'm going to mute that for you. I can't tell which gender is whose. And I think that's what they want. They're playing guitars, they're going across the country... They're kicking ass, they're taking names. You can see the characters in this. But this game took four years to make and and got funding from the government. $1.4 million from the Norwegian government and another, I think it was 166000 from the European Union's like grant program, okay? So the problem with this game is not that they made this hilarious game making fun of social justice, it's that it's such a parody of reality that it hurts. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so honest that it hurts and it's so bad. So the game mechanics, as they are, are just wildly DEI, woke, left-wing, whatever you want to call them. And these are actual mechanics from the game that people have uncovered. So you do things like normalize things to get negative reactions and negative feelings. You cancel people. This will allow us to isolate people from their friends and compatriots in battle. This could be a useful tool against enemies, it says. And we bully people to get them to do what we want to do. And we sow discord among people to get them, you know, uh, you know, get them fighting within each other. Now, this would be hilarious if this was a, you know, a real parody of a game. Like, let's make it so that you... <laughs> You can cancel people and then the game teaches you that it's bad. Or if it was just an obvious joke, like they would do in a Grand Theft Auto game. But it's not, unfortunately. And we're going to show you some clips from the game. And it's actually hilarious. And by the way, the company that made this, which is Red Thread, I think it is. Yeah, Red Thread Games. They're owned by a French company, which is owned by... Or they're operating under a French company that's owned by China. So government money from Western countries developed by a company that's owned by Chinese people. It really writes itself. But I want to show you a clip of it. This is a scene where the main character, this girl, is being asked by some detectives if the black guy she's friends with, and obviously she's black, so it's not weird to, to say that, if that guy has any information. And this is how the game gets you to the respond. The fellow you're with, uh, a black kid, dresses like a writer. Does he know anything? You are racist. <laughs> Tell your way. So I guess she has options of some say something, say nothing. With, uh, the black kid. But then I don't know if that's a zoom in on the game or if somebody just does that in the video they're making. But the option is to get triggered and call them racist. You are racist. Again, this is not her name is Pax. This is not a joke, people. This is a real game. In this other clip. There is a robot who, by the way, I want to show this first. This is robot is a, is apparently a, I don't know if it's a female or what, but this robot is a, I don't know. It has pronouns. Is that what I'm seeing here? This robot has she, her pronouns, but it sounds like a guy. I don't know why a robot would need pro pronouns. But this robot sounds like a guy, and it's just trying to give her this girl a ride. It's just trying to say, you know, I can help you with what you're trying to accomplish here. And then the reaction that the game tells forces you to do is to think that it, 
the robot's trying to creep on you, like be perverted with you. I don't know. It's the only option the game gives you. And uh, there's some podcasters. I wish I knew who it was, but they're talking over this. You'll hear them. Oh, hello. Ma'am, I'll be happy to serve as your driver. So she immediately insults the robot. And I know I get, get we're getting into the nitty gritty here. Here, like, big fat wannabe non-binary girl with the socks and everything, you know. And then we got the dumpy blue-haired girl. These are the characters. I want to assure you that I'm fully capable of operating this vehicle. I don't mean that you have software, of course. You lack the paperwork, but I don't need any. D does that robot sound like a she, her? I... Yeah, I'm not going to be mean to it. I don't know if there's a way through, though. Don't touch me. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> See, it seems like a joke. Watch when she freaks out how everybody's like, what the hell? I don't know if there's a way through, though. Don't touch me. Hey. What was that? <laughs> so the game, it, it had um, seven, it peaked at 76 concurrent players in its first few days. That's insane. This game had 1.4 million from the Norwegian government and another 166,000 from the European Union through its uh, creative EU grant program. Four years, $1.6 million. Did I say 1.6? 166 grand plus 1.4. 1.56 million dollars in four years, and that's what they came up with. And if you're still thinking, Andrew, this is still a joke, it's hilarious, because it is. This is what they said when people complained about it. When we first announced the game, we since we've announced the game, we've read your comments and listened to your feedback. Hopes and wishes for the game. Over the past four years, four years to make this, our team has poured their hearts into telling a story that's deeply meaningful meaningful to us. A story about the power of words, about building a world where everyone can feel safe, about love, friendships, and robots, of course. So this girl's reactions in the game aren't because they're hilarious, it's because she's trying to condition the other characters into acting the correct way, right? It goes on. We expected Dustborn to spark conch conversation and debate and look forward to engaging with our players in a positive and constructive fashion unfortunately that conversation has been drowned out by a tidal wave of hate and abuse it's always the hate and abuse people we welcome thoughtful feedback and respectful criticism we embrace discussion and debate but we have zero tolerance for hate speech harassment and threats of any kind do you think they're really getting threats Hate speech is anything. Those who engage in such behavior will be removed from our community. Your community of what? A hundred people? To everyone else, thank you for coming on this journey with us. Your support means everything and your constructive feedback continues to push us to learn and evolve. Together, let's continue to build a world where everyone can feel valued and empowered to share their stories. This is what they say every time. Ubisoft is saying it from their games. You know, um, that Concord game that got canceled is saying it. They don't say, I guess we made a shit game. They say, well, the people that stuck with us, they're truly the correct ones. And everything else is just hate speech. This is what happens when these studios give these people mo this money. They don't spend four years. How can we make this really cool? How can we do some innovative things? I guess that is innovative, but they spend their time finding people who agree with them ideologically funneling the money to make like that games in like comic book style. Like this is not cutting edge technology at all. My thinking is they just find people that they like and agree with them to pay, to work on this game, overpay them. And they focus on the injection of the narrative and this bullshit into the games. Cause this is what keeps happening. You get underperforming games that are underwhelming in their graphic and gameplay capabilities and yet they have huge budgets and take year to make years to make the Star Wars game, the Assassin's Creed game has been going for so long it's not even out yet. I don't think the Concord game, um, the uh, Suicide Squad game that lost two hundred million dollars. They get all this money and all this time, and what do they do? They shit the bed completely, and that's bound to happen sometimes. But when it's in this DEI style, you can't help but think that they would act how they do when they're given government power and, and companies, BLM style, they circulate their money. They don't really accomplish anything. 
And if they have to put out a product, it ends up being the most shit thing. Have you ever watched or looked at like a diversity packet or learning plan or lesson plan that groups have put out? It doesn't make any sense. And it's not even like intelligent speak meant to co that could possibly convince you of anything. It's just like white supremacy, uh, you know, people are racist, being mean is should be against the law, etc. It not it's never anything compelling. You ever read like a climate change initiative for a municipality? There's one from Boston where they just, they're just like, we need millions of dollars. Their ideas were put more water fountains in places and let people come inside community, come inside community centers when it's hot outside. These are their ideas. These, th these people are more focused on just getting money and giving it to their friends than they are making or creating anything worthwhile. One, because they don't know how they don't actually have any ideas. They don't actually know about the things that they're spouting. And two, because they're there to further their, their, their own position. It's not about actually saving the environment or stopping racism. It's about feeling good about themselves and feeling important. And that's what they will continue to do in these games. And I guess, you know, transgender robots that don't sound like women. It's a caretaker. The robot is a caretaker robot, and you thought it was, you know, sexually harassing you, even though it's a she, her. <laughs> I want to move on here to Taylor Swift. Oh, T Swift. Oh, Taylor. She's just so innocent. She's just, she doesn't know what she's doing. That's the prevailing theme when people talk about her politics. She She's just middle of the road. She never really talks about politics. She's just trying to get along. We forgive her. You know, I was watching a video of Dave Portnoy on Fox News, and he's, you know, painfully pro-Taylor Swift. And, you know, she should be able to give her opinion, but it's wrong. Um, I kind of wish the athletes give the answers that... Um, what was I watching where they were just refusing? I think it's a lot of football players. I don't remember, but... Basically, when they say... it, was, um, Caitlin Clark, I think, was one of them. But basically, when players just say... You know, I just think people should vote. I mean, that's the easiest way out of it. Because, you know, do we we complain when we hear from them and sometimes we complain when they don't stand up for things. And it's so it's kind of their right to decide where that is, but we have the right to say that they're wrong and you know how pushy they are about the subject matters too. But Taylor Swift, you know, she's dating a guy in a clearly concocted PR relationship who's sponsored by Pfizer and People think that she's never given political opinions before, but that's wrong because I remember I have the brain of remembrance. Remembrance brain, I think, is the holiday. In 2018, she endorsed two Tennessee Democrats, former two-term uh, governor Bill Bredson, running for U.S. Senate and incumbent House member Representative Jim Hooper. I think one of them ended up winning, but Taylor Swift at the time made an Instagram post about this and said how, you know, we're fighting against racism and all this other crap, and people largely forget that, but this is not, like, she's not 17, even though she kind of acts like it uh, with her relationship song. She's not stupid. She's not apolitical. She's talked about this and her beliefs for years, and I want to go to her latest endorsement of Kamal Harris because it's terrible, and we can pretend, you know, the, the conservative leaning women and the and the other women who want to pretend like this isn't a big deal that she, she like we can pretend that it's not a big deal if she, we admit that her opinions are stupid but she's got a massive following she's a cajillionaire and all of a sudden we should just give her the benefit of the doubt even though she has shown time and time again that she has at best no idea what she's talking about and just faking it for you know the benefits or political leanings or her apparent political leanings will give her, or she has terrible opinions. Choose your poison. She says on Instagram, like many of you, I watch the debate. If you haven't already, now is a great time to do your research. See, that's fine. As a voter, I make sure to watch and read everything about their proposed policies for this, for the plans of this country. Do you believe that? I do not believe that. I guess the word is, I read everything I can, which is probably not that much. Recently, I was made aware that AI of me falsely endorsing Donald Trump's presidential run was posted to his site. It really conjured up my fears around AI and dangers of spreading misinformation. Red flag number one, misinformation. It brought me to the conclusion that I need to be very transparent about my actual plans for this election as a voter. The simplest way to combat misinformation is with the truth. You could have just said I didn't endorse Trump. You could have just said, like, that wasn't me. I haven't endorsed anyone. 
<gasps> uh, but I have to. I have it. Like the language being used here is obvious, and when people say that, you know, they make excuses for her, just like they would. People complain that people make excuses for Trump. When people make excuse excuses for Taylor Swift, it's obviously from like a overly supportive fan perspective. Misinformation. It's just, it's just AI. It's just wrong. I guess it's misinformation. Just say that it's not real. She says, I will be casting my vote for Kamala Harris and Tim Walz in the 24 election. I'm voting Kamala Harris, which I needed to tag her, of course, as well, because she fights for the rights and causes I believe need a warrior to champion them. Doesn't mention anything she fights for because she doesn't fight for anything. I think she is a steady handed, LOL, gifted leader, double LOL. And I believe we can accomplish much more in this country if we're led by calm and not chaos. Same tactics as before. Kamala Harris has only been in office for four years and taken over for the presidency for at least the last few months. But, you know, we will be better off with a shittier economy, more illegal immigration and all this stuff with Kamala Harris, right? I was so heartened, Taylor Swift went on to say, and impressed by her selection of running mate Tim Waltz who has been standing up for gay rights, IVF, and a woman's right to her own body for decades. So here are three things that are the most retarded things to bring up. Um, and part of how she acts like she's a teenager. Because what are LGBTQ rights? It's not gay rights. There's no other rights that we're missing here. You've already got the ability to marry, which, you know, that's an argument that we can have. But obviously the only thing people care about is the indoctrination of children. Like I said earlier, nobody cares if transgender A and B want to go and B, C, D in a gay uh, bar full of drag queens. Nobody cares about that. It's when they are reading about the stuff to children. They're pushing these fringe sexual perversities on children and that you want to transition, trans the kid, as, as they say. That's what people care about. So to call it rights the right to cut off, you know, kids body parts, is that the right? They don't have to explain this. Next thing, IVF. Trump supports that. Okay, so do you support Trump in that then? Woman's right to her own body. That's up to the states now. That's not the president's concern. He didn't make he didn't overrule it. The Supreme Court did. Yes, it was with the justices he chose, but the president doesn't control this. Sorry that this happened to you, that it's up to the states now. Sorry that there's more freedom. Sorry that people actually get to decide on this. So three things she brings up are terrible points to bring up, and they are meant to appeal to young people of her fan base. Gay rights, not a thing that people are missing, that, you know, not a big issue at all because it's vastly made up. People have concern with children. IVF that Trump supports and women's rights that's up to the states. So three things that are meant to trigger the mind of a young voter is what she goes with and they're all shit shit examples she goes on to say i've done my research and i've made my choice your research is all yours to do and the choice to yours choice is yours to make i also want to say especially for first-time voters remember that in order to vote you have to be registered the reason why a lot of leftists and our obvious leftists like taylor swift say don't forget to be registered to vote is because they know if their fans register to vote, those will be left-leaning individuals. That's why the, whenever you hear a company say, we just want to register you to vote, that's a company that obviously has leanings one way or the other. It has an inherent base of who it's promoting to. That's why, you know, I think I saw one by, uh, I think supported by the Nelk Boys to sign up to vote. vote. Obviously, their fans are more likely to be right-wing. So this whole idea is like, I just hope people will register and I hope they'll register at voteblue.org or something like that. Or I just hope that all of Taylor fans will, Taylor Swift fans, fans will register. I wonder who they would vote for after she endorsed them. But they're going with the same strategy as 2016, even harder than what they did for 2020. We saw at the debate Kamala Harris brought back everything. Find people on both sides calling them rapists, all these things, election fraud, all these things are meant to just be blips on the radar. Oh, all these felonies, these guys, convicted felon. All these things are just little droplets in a cup of a person's uninformed political mind. Why? Because with each drop that fills that cup, this is an orange man bad cup. 
It fills with orangeness to the top till it explodes in your face <laughs> and scolds you uh, with acid, right? No cultures would ever scold people, scold people with acid. Scold? Scald? Scald people. He scolded him. He scalded him. No people would ever scald anybody with acid in any culture. So these are all just little headlines that they drop into people's brains so that they think that there's this overwhelming narrative that it's obvious that Trump is a bad person. All of these little things take five lines or maybe five minutes to dispute, to give nuance to. Find people on both sides. Obviously debunked, he said, not the neo-Nazis. The Gold Star families, obviously, they, they insulted him first. The story about him saying that these guys were suckers never actually happened. Um, you know, put kids in cages. Obama did first. There's the conversation about you, if you're committing a crime, you don't get to have your children with you in prison. All these different things. The felonies, well, what are they actually about? The impeachments, well, what are they actually about? They focus on things that take explanation so that low information leftists can actually, and I hate using that term, but it's true. They're lacking in information in this. And I'm sure somebody will say the same about me, but it's so that they can just rattle these things off or keep them as a list in their head that makes them say orange man bad. And if you want some of this in real time, watch one of those Jubilee things I recently watched. Not just with Charlie Kirk, but with Alex Stein was on one where they bring both sides together. And they bring up some of these things. And you see the people there and they just, they're so sure. But you don't have time to explain the whole world to them. It's like, I get six headlines a week from social media about Orange Man being bad. And that's all I need. And on all of these programs you see, there's always like a, a normal looking girl or two. And they see the guys that are on their side. They look down their panel and it's a guy with capri pants on or it's six gay guys or it's a guy who looks like he just came out of the basement literally. And not that that's necessarily a bad thing. We don't think we love basements. I have a basement of my own. And she look, looks up and down. And she starts to realize that these are the guys that are agreeing with her. It's because they want women to pay attention to them and, and like them. This is the, the backdrop for a lot of this, this sort of thing. And I hear what you're saying, that it's sad because it is. But every man knows this, right? Every man knows when there's an allegedly straight guy agreeing with all the women about everything, even when their opinions can be stupid. And guys can have stupid opinions, too. But when a guy's just being, I believe in feminism and equal representation, it's because he want, that's his way of getting attention from girls. And when you watch these videos, you see the girls sort of noticing that, seeing, smelling the desperation, and you're, and you're seeing them realize that all the guys that agree with them are not exactly the most masculine men is what I'm trying to say there. So they keep doing these things. They keep bringing it back and they want it to stick in your mind. They don't think you can think for yourself. They don't think that you'll remember that Taylor Swift endorsed these people in 2018. She's just doing the best she can. She's just a sweet, innocent 17 year old girl. Taylor Swift just happens to be dating an NFL player for publicity who just happens to be sponsored by Pfizer. Turn it up, Jordan.